Hi, everybody. Welcome to 2021. It ain't that stinky old 2020 anymore. Thank goodness we finally got through it. I hope most of us are healthy and happy now. Um, I know we've probably lost a few people, and, but, um, you know, we're, we see a light at the end of the tunnel. It is the new year, and we're glad to be there. We've been making some changes at the Astro Imaging Channel, and I want to tell you about them um, if I can figure out how to do all this. I'm going to present my entire screen. And the first place I'm going to go is, oh, let me get over here. Yeah, I don't need that for right now. Um, oh, what am I going to do today? This is our calendar coming up, okay? Um, uh, Bob Buckheim is going to be here today, and he's going to be telling us about some of the things he does fun with amateur spectroscopy, chasing the rainbow. Um, Bob has been here before, and he's actually quite well known in the circles. He does a lot of stuff with um, science imaging that um, he turns a lot of people on into making scientific contributions to with their astro imaging equipment and i think that you know pretty pictures is great and we should all stick with pretty pictures but there's also some other things we could be doing with our cameras this is one of them next week kevin francis is going to be telling us about what he's learned in his relatively short but quite successful career um, hobby career as an astro imager and then Adam Block is going to be subbing for us. Isn't it nice to have this kind of a substitute when you need it? Uh, we haven't gotten clear. Uh, we had a we had somebody else scheduled in there, and they had to reschedule till later. And uh, so we we contacted Adam, and gracious as always, he's stepping in. And then uh, you remember a while back, um, the we had a presenter telling us about sprites and stuff that he images. Well, Steve Hummel is going to be uh, calling us and talking us, to us about some stuff like he's going to be presenting about some of those kinds of atmospheric things. And as you can see, we're pretty well um, scheduled up, uh, coming up for a while. And we've got three, uh, well, we've got a couple of blanks yet between now and April 18th, otherwise we're fully scheduled. We need you to help fill in those blanks. And you can fill in those blanks by going to the contact page here on our website, the astroimagingchannel.org and contacts, tell us what your name is, what your email is, and make a comment in the comment, tell us what you would like to present to us about, okay? We'd really need that help. This astroimaging work uh, channel is, um, is a product, it's a club of people. It's not anything magic amazing. It's people that make it work. And we need you as some of the people who are watching the programs to every now and then um, put out other programs. Now, we have something like 300 and something, I don't, I don't know exactly, shows in the Astro Imaging channel. And if you go to our past shows, uh, you'll see that, well, we've got a, some links, but we don't do a very good job of keeping that page up. Okay. And we decided that there probably is a better way to do that. And we're starting to move to a new page. So if you go to the astroimagingchannel.org uh, and goes to go to the program database, you'll find out that there's a new page. And that new page describes how you can find the 300 and some uh, programs that we've already put out. Uh, there never has been a really good way to search, but there are three ways you can find um, shows. One is by going to YouTube. And if you go to YouTube itself, you will find a page called the video. Okay, it's right there. It's pretty obvious. You've probably seen it before. Um, and on, if you go to click on the videos, you will find a list of all of the programs we've ever had. They're right there. Another thing is the spreadsheet, and I'm going to save that till later. Uh, and then the third thing is some work that I think Molly did a while back. She organized a bunch of the shows into playlists, and those playlists are things like um, off the beaten path ast uh, um, astrophotography software, general tips and tricks, solar system imaging, conferences and star parties, and all that other kind of stuff. So you can go to the playlist. Both of those are on YouTube itself. The third thing, that took a little work. 
we've started a spreadsheet that has a bit more annotation. You can look at that spreadsheet. You click on this file right here, and um, you can. It's a it's a, a Google spreadsheet. It's actually a, an Excel spreadsheet. And if you don't mind, I will just call it up out of my files here. And you can see that it is a full-blown spreadsheet. And that's all it is, OK? Well, can I get that up bigger? Oh, I can get it way bigger. And uh, the columns are the date. And each of these is a link. If you click on that date, it will take you to the link. It'll take you to the program, and you can watch the program. It tells you who the presenter is, what the title of the program is, has a brief description of it, and some key words that you might want to search through real quickly. The problem with the YouTube page, the problem with our old past shows page, is that it was just hard to work with. Um, so we decided to develop something like this, and it is a full spreadsheet. You can, you've got, it's got two pages in it. You can go back to the raw data part, and these are the actual unformatted, uh, just, just as it is. Over here, it's formatted a little bit more and organized. Um, and you can download a copy of this and use it. You can uh, access it real time. It's a, uh, on Google Spreadsheets. Oh, the things I wanted to tell you about it is we're going to try to keep it up each week. It's real easy to keep up if you do it each week. It's really hard to do it if you try to go back through the 100,000 years or so that we've been doing this and all the different programs. So we need help. I mean, we need help in a lot of different ways. Get out of here for a second. Go back to here. You can volunteer to help with this program database. If you click here, it'll call up your, your email system. And uh, if you've seen a program that you can see hasn't been annotated yet, you can annotate it for us. You can describe what you saw in it, make up a few lines about it, make up a few keywords, and, and tell us when the program was, who it was, and we'll take it from there. Or if you would really like to, you know, if you watch a lot of these programs, <clears throat> If you watch a lot of these programs and you would like to be a regular volunteer doing that, we need to expand our data, our, our, our group of people that are doing the show. There's Molly, there's Tolga, there's me, there's Eric, there's Cherry, and we need more people helping us. We need more regular, more groupies, more nerds that want to jump in and do this on a regular basis. Here is one of the places you can volunteer to do that. Okay. Where am I now? I think I'm going to stop that for a while because we've had plenty of um, plenty of time to work on it. Oh, no, 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 I can't do that because here we've got, this is a rough draft of, um, um, as you know, we're doing our program on Orion right now. I need people to um, contribute uh, shots of Orion. And did I really close? Yeah, I really closed it. There, there it goes. Where do I want to go? I want to go here. Um, this is our homepage. And it says, if you go to our homepage, it says, go to Orion time tab up here. Click on that. And here are the rules for submitting your programs for Orion time. All right, your, your images for Orion time. Um, any objects in Orion or Orion as a whole, you can have, they can be movie or still. It's got to be taken this apparition sometime this year, you know, this, this, this trip through our skies. Um, try to make it at least 1080 pixels on one side. Not mandatory, but if you make it much smaller than that, by the time we blow it back up to see on the slides, it's, you know, it needs help. Um, so you just click down below to submit it. Now, if you have submitted it on Facebook, we've tried to go back and pick them up and, and put them in here. But uh, we would prefer if you would actually directly submit them by going here on the Submit File button. <sighs> Did I get everything I was supposed to get? Is Bob Buckheim almost ready to, to do his show? Where do I need oh, to be next? Almost. Almost? Okay, Bob, take over. Let's see if I can stop sharing. Okay, you have stop to sharing. stop and I'll start. I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Window.
share. Okay, does that look like a uh, PowerPoint slide? Yes, I think you're good. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Alex, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, for uh, those in the audience uh, who don't know me, uh, I've uh, got into astronomy a long, long time ago because I would hear about astronomical objects or events, and I wanted to see them for myself. Uh, sometimes with my own eyes screwed into an eyepiece, uh, sometimes in images that I'd made, uh, and sometimes by making measurements of what's going on in the sky. Uh, for the last uh, 15 years, uh, my avocation has centered on research projects where amateurs with small telescopes can make a genuine contribution to astronomical science. Things like measuring asteroid light curves, photometry of variable stars, uh, et cetera. So tonight's topic is spectroscopy, uh, an art that combines both astroimaging and measurements. I'll talk about uh, what's the deal with spectroscopy, what can you see, and how do you go about doing it? Let's start with this image that I stole off the Orange County Astronomer's website. Uh, any astro image like this has an enormous amount of information. Uh, there's brightnesses and positions and patterns. Uh, a few months ago, Barbara Harris talked to you about brightness, the science of photometry, and how you can measure the changing brightness of a variable star in images just like this. If you do your imaging or your photometry in two or three different wavelength bands, then you gain even more information and more beauty. Spectroscopy is sort of like color imaging on steroids. Instead of three or four or five filters, you look in several hundred different colors, dividing the brightness of, of an object into ever more narrow wavelength regions to see the details of the energy distribution of that object. That's the deal with spectroscopy. Simplest way and cheapest way uh, to experience it uh -huh. is for a couple hundred bucks, uh, buy a uh, star analyzer grading and the, and the necessary adapters to put it on the front of your uh, digital SLR camera. Put the camera on a tripod, no clock drive, no guiding, aim at a bright star and rotate the grating so that the spectrum is spread perpendicular to the sidereal motion of the target. You know, spread the spectrum north, south, and let the target trail uh, in, in east-west as the sky rotates. Take a five or 10 second image and voila, you've made your first spectrum. It's turned the, the image of the star into a streak of light and it shows the characteristic rainbow of a spectrum with dark bands crossing vertically in this image, crossing the spectrum, uh, representing places where the starlight is either absent or at least very weak. Um, that pattern of the, the strength and position of those spectral lines is sort of a barcode. The pioneers of spectroscopy, Fraunhofer, Bunsen, and, and their followers, discovered that every atom and every molecule has its own unique barcode in the spectrum. Uh, these uh, one, two, not quite three, uh, two, one in the dark blue, one in the medium blue, and one in the deep, deep red uh, are the characteristic spectrum of hydrogen. So it turns out the, the barcode, uh, because it's unique for each atom and molecule, and because any given uh, atom or molecule's barcode is influenced by the local temperature, the local pressure, and the velocity of the sample that you're looking at, that means that now you can measure the properties and composition of stars without having to go get a piece of the star and put it in a test tube. And in a picture like this, you can understand why people quickly started calling these spectral lines. It's a vertical line crossing the spectrum. Now this sort of a, uh, ah, those are the lines I was referring to. This sort of 
uh, spectrum taken with that uh, grating covering the uh, objective of your uh, camera is exactly the kind of thing that uh, they were making in the early 20th century with uh, objective prisms uh, projecting the starlight onto a glass plate and, and uh, uh, developing it into a specter like this that they used to make the first uh, characterization and, um, and uh, definition of what do we mean by different spectral types. Um, the, okay, oh, here's, here's my picture of Orion, since you, Alex said we're doing Orion this month. Here's my picture of Orion. Uh, this time taken with that same DS, DSLR camera, mounted this time on a driven mount. So the stars are dots and the spectra are linear streaks. Now a thing like this gets a little tricky to interpret until you're used to it. Uh, the zero order image, that's the straight image of the star is just a point like image like this guy in the upper uh, right hand corner. The grating smears the light out into the first diffracted order that gives you this rainbow, which is the spectrum of that star. Every star in the image forms a spectrum and the spectrum all are smeared out uh, in that same direction toward the uh, lower left. So here are the, the stars in Orion's belt and their uh, spectra. Here's M42. And if we look a little closer at M42 and, its, and the adjacent stars, uh, you see one of the interesting things that, that in spectra, if you, is my pointer showing? Maybe. No, no, I don't see the pointer. No. Okay. In the, uh, uh, you see two stars uh, next to each other in the uh, upper right, and their spectra smeared out. And like the, the spectrum of that single star on the undriven mount, it's, it's a continuous rainbow. Uh, there may be spectral features in it, but it's, it's a smooth kind of a continuum of colored light. The, uh, the nebula is a whole different deal. Um, it is almost entirely just two blobs, uh, one in the far red and uh, one in the, in the middle green blue. Um, what that's telling us is that the nebula emits only on certain specific wavelengths, the two wavelengths uh, represented here. Um, and note that the uh, size and shape of the red image and the blue image in the spectrum are basically identical to the image of the nebula itself. That's going to become important uh, in a few minutes. Hey, Bob. Yo. Uh, we, we can see your pointer uh, when you're moving it around the screen. So if you, if you want to point to stuff, cool. we should be able to see that. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I may take advantage of that. Now, this objective grading idea is uh, simple. It's a wonderful uh, tour into the, the long ago history of uh, astronomical spectroscopy, but it's got some really severe limitations. Primarily, you got a one inch aperture. Uh, so realistically, you're restricted to bright stars. Uh, the spectral resolution is driven by the size of the star images, mostly seeing and focus and maybe aberrations in your optics. Um, that's unfortunate. Uh, the spectral range, if you're using a uh, DSLR that's unmodified, uh, your spectral range is limited by that Bayer mask in that camera, which means seriously very little H alpha response. Um, my old DSLR is uh, one of the old 12-bit cameras, so it's really tough to balance uh, getting a, an exposure with a good enough signal but don't saturate. Nevertheless, uh, this is really educational and it makes some nice pretty images. But if you want to go to the next step with that uh, SA100 grading, get around the aperture limitation, not too hard. Uh, made it to your CCD imager and the telescope and good mount that you use for your astro imaging like this. Uh, Take your CCD camera, mate the little SA100 grating to it. Uh, the grating will fit in your filter wheel, by the way. Uh, so that's one alternative. Slip it into your telescope. And now you can start making 
uh, spectra using the full aperture of your telescope. The optical diagram is shown here. Uh, light from your telescope is coming in from the right uh, and it's focused on the focal plane where your CCD is. But on its way, it passes through the grating. Now the grating does two things. Uh, one is it lets some of the light go through pretty much uh, unblemished. And so you get the uh, what we call the zero order image right where you would have uh, on your focal plane. But the light is also diffracted by the grating, uh, sent off here into the spectrum, the smear of light, the rainbow, uh, that spreads the starlight out into a spectrum. If you look in detail at what's going on in the focal plane, uh, it looks like this. Here's, here's the zero order, the image of the star. Here's the first order diffracted spectrum. Uh, those of you who have had the class in diffraction know that the grading equation permits uh, both a plus one and a minus one diffracted order. Uh, and that's still true here also. So there is a minus one diffracted order that also shows up on your focal plane. And there's a plus two and a minus two diffracted order. You can see the, the uh, plus two diffracted order here. Um, in, uh, in a simple grading, plus one and minus one diffraction orders would be equal in brightness, but the SA100 is what's called a blazed diffraction grading. Uh, it's designed to send most of the incoming light into the plus one diffracted order. And that's why that guy is so bright, brighter even than the zero order, which is good because that's where the information that, uh, that you're looking for is going to show up. Um, the other thing about this uh, sort of a setup is the diffraction angle of this particular uh, SA100 grating is about three and a half degrees. Obviously, it depends a little bit on the wavelength, but it's in that neighborhood. And what that means is the physical size of the spectrum on your chip is really driven by that angle, three and a half degrees, and the distance from your chip to the position of the grating. Um, that's why you might not want to put the grating into your filter wheel, depending on your setup. That might be too close to the chip to get a nicely spread out spectrum. Uh, and that's why when I uh, put it on my ST8, uh, I uh, rather than uh, put it into the filter wheel, I used uh, the adapters that I had in the goodie box to put it about three or four inches away from the uh, focal plane. But uh, you still get a smear of light and uh, you take that smear of light into uh, Maxim, for example, uh, and plot the uh, signal level, ADUs on each pixel as a function of pixel position. And you get this kind of a graph, which is a stereotypical modern spectrum, a graph of intensity versus length intensity, it's ADU count, and it's not really wavelength, it's pixel position. So at that point, you need a way to translate pixel position into wavelength in angstroms. Um, I picked this particular star, uh, Al Resha, because it is what is called a spectral class A star, which uh, like the, uh, the DSLR image that I showed, is characterized by these bright, strong hydrogen absorption features, the so-called bomber lines. The thing about those is, you know their laboratory wavelengths with great precision. And that means that you can measure their positions on your spectrum, uh, measure from the zero order star image to the H alpha, H beta, H gamma lines on your spectrum take that and make a little table in a spreadsheet uh, showing the, the uh, pixel position here of zero order, H alpha, H beta, et cetera. Here's the pixel positions. Um, calculate how far from the zero order each of these lines is. You know the laboratory wavelengths, and so you can do a linear fit. That equation of, of wavelength in angstroms versus pixel position 
that's a function of your instrumental setup. And so now you can apply that equation to any spectrum you take with that setup to turn it into a genuine spectrum of signal versus wavelength in angstroms. Um, now, when I've worked with students on projects like this, um, I find that the brighter ones look at this and they maybe remember a lecture that their teacher taught them about black bodies and the, uh, the spectral energy distribution from a black body and they get really excited about the idea of, I can measure the temperature of the star by fitting a black body curve to this, uh, the continuum profile of this star spectrum. It's really tempting, um, unless it fails, because even though the wavelength is now properly calibrated, the intensity is not. What this intensity curve represents is the actual light coming out of the star as modified by atmospheric transmission, which is a strong function of wavelength, modified again by the instrumental response, the quantum efficiency of the, of the camera you're using, the, the transmission of the optics you're using. And so it turns out that mostly what you're seeing in the uh, intensity profile here is the atmosphere and the instrumental response. But there are ways, uh, which I'm not going to go into at this point, uh, to back out the atmosphere and the instrumental response so that you can actually get a picture of the um, uh, energy distribution coming directly out of the star. But that requires a little more work. Now, this sort of slitless spectroscopy setup um, overcomes uh, the disadvantages of using the grating as a, um, an aperture. You're using the full aperture of your telescope. That means you can take a uh, spectra of fainter targets. Might be able to fit it into your filter wheel, which is really convenient. And there are some cool projects, uh, real science, uh, that uh, can be done uh, with this kind of a setup. You can measure the redshift of uh, quasars and supernova. You can actually do the classification of newly discovered supernova. You know, is it a supernova 1A or a supernova B? Uh, the, you can see the characteristic uh, spectral features in uh, supernova with a very simple setup like this. Limitations. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the dispersion of the spectrum is set by the distance from the grating to the focal plane. Uh, and that may complicate your setup. Uh, more importantly, just like using the grating on a, uh, as an objective grating, the spectral resolution is set by the size of the star image, um, which means if you have bad seeing on that night, you're going to get lower resolution spectra. And it's not good at all for making spectra on extended targets like planets, nebula, or galaxies for the same reason that you saw in the uh, spectrum of M42. You're going to, each spectral feature is going to be a blob, the size and shape of that extended body. And that smears the spectral information out to the point where uh, for most objects, uh, the uh, sharp spectral features that you're looking for are, are completely washed away. Now the business about the spectral resolution being set by the size of the star image is, um, uh, one of the more important concepts in spectroscopy and one that can really make your head hurt until you uh, think hard about it. Um, let's, let's look at this spectrum on the, um, on the left that uh, shows, let's say, a spectrum of a star made with this slitless spectrograph setup. And you see a rainbow, you know, the continuum of light coming from the star. But let's imagine if we had a star that only radiated on a single wavelength, you know, like a laser does, one wavelength, then what we would see at that particular wavelength is that, even though it's a single infinitesimally small wavelength, you don't see an infinitesimally small dot in the spectrum. You see an image of the star, and that means there's a limit to how well you can separate wavelengths because they're smeared out 
by the size of the star. That's why um, you may want to move to a spectrograph that has a slit in it. The object being measured is focused onto that white slit. So the yellow star hits a screen, only the light that passes through the slit goes into the spectrograph. The rest of the light is lost, but in return, on the uh, right side, same, same star, same spectrum, make the same imaginary idea that the star is radiating only on a single infinitesimal wavelength like a laser. This then, that wavelength, this then is what you would see. Suddenly you have a fine, narrow spectrum from that big blobby star, and that increases the resolution of the spectra that you take through a slit instrument. So with that in mind, uh, you want better resolution. Maybe you want to make spectra of, of extended objects. Maybe you want to be able to optimize the instrument for a certain dispersion and resolution to match your camera, for example. Uh, and maybe you're a little uncomfortable with that pulling it up by your bootstraps approach of using the star A star that you're measuring to identify the wavelength calibration of your instrument. For example, how do you know that that star doesn't have any radial velocity that redshifts the spectral lines, hence throwing off uh, your uh, wavelength calibration? So maybe you want to incorporate a uh, calibration lamp uh, for uh, wavelength calibration into the instrument. Can be done. Um, you can do it yourself if you're a good tinkerer, which I am not. Uh, the good news is you can buy a commercial spectrograph designed for amateur scale telescopes. Uh, the one I bought was the Alpi from Shelyac Instruments in France. Uh, the Alpi core spectrograph assembly costs about a thousand bucks. You can also buy a guide module for another thousand bucks and a calibration module for yet another thousand bucks. Uh, it looks like this uh, on, the, on a little uh, workbench. Um, the, the motto of Shelyak Instruments is that stars won't look the same. And that's absolutely true. Uh, instead of looking like a little dot on your image, the spectrograph turns the dot into this streak of light. And you can see all the richness of the spectral features of, uh, of that little dot now. Uh, and uh, with a little bit of uh, software, you can turn that streak into a graph of intensity versus wavelength, which is what you're usually going to use for, uh, for your measurements. The, um, uh, the ALPI will show you some really good educational things. Uh, you can make uh, spectra of stars of different spectral class from the the uh, the blue uh, class B and A stars uh, to the the sun-like F and G class stars and the uh, redder K and M type stars and and this is a kind of a graph that you'd see in um, in a textbook for example of uh, the meaning of the different spectral classes properly wavelength calibrated along the bottom proper representation of the intensity of the continuum in the y-axis. And now you can start saying things, instead of saying, well, this is a blue star and this is a red star, you can say this star is red in this particular way. You know, look at the richness of the spectral features there. And every red star is red in its own peculiar way. And so now you start learning new things about those stars. Um, Bob, do you have time for a couple of questions before you move on? Absolutely. So there were, uh, Beatrice asked about, you know, getting started and how much it, what it would cost to do. And I think you've covered that just a, a moment ago, but if you're starting off with a simple uh, grading that you put on the front and kind of work your way up, uh, what would you recommend and what do you think the cost would be besides the ones you presented? 
Um, well, the uh, kind of the go-to choice is the SA100 uh, grading, which uh, it, it, has Tom Field been uh, here on the Astro Imaging channel recently? I don't remember. Okay, it's um, R spec R S P E C dash Astro dot com uh, is uh, Tom Field's uh, website. He is absolutely uh, the apostle to the the beginning uh, spectroscopists. Uh, you can buy the SA one hundred grading uh, from him. My recollection is about two hundred dollars, uh, and if you want to. Uh, do like the picture I showed, mating it to uh, your DSLR kit lens. Um, he'll point you to the uh, the adapters that you need to do that, which, as I recall, were maybe another $100. Um, and and it, it, you, can, you can make some pretty pictures and get um, uh, a really good education on the meaning of the uh, uh, stellar spectral types. In fact, um, uh, you can't exactly deal with the intensity part, but uh, you can make uh, a, a collage like this showing uh, what the different spectral types of stars mean in their spectrum and how to tell whether this unknown object you're looking at, you know, is it a class A or a class M star? Um, and if you've already got an astro imaging setup, uh, take that same grading. Uh, it's, it screws into an inch and a quarter uh, adapter. Uh, put it in your filter wheel or put it on the nose piece of your uh, CCD. Put it on a small telescope uh, and, and go to town. Uh, another question from Greg is, can you use any of this spectroscopy or diffraction grading to determine what your light pollution is and so determine you know what filters you might need to block out the light pollution uh yeah in fact um i don't have an example anywhere in this briefing but uh with with my alpi spectrograph the image that you see uh, is mostly a, a black image with a streak that's the star spectrum uh, across the center but above and below, you see the light pollution lines. You can actually see here's the, you know, here's the sodium lamps and here's the mercury lamps uh, in the spectrum. So the answer is yes. That may be more expense than you want to go through to tell that, but find somebody that in your neighborhood that has a spectrograph uh, and you can absolutely characterize that. So you don't have to point it directly at, say, a, a street light to do that. Mm -mm. No, just uh, point it up at the sky and take a take a long exposure, and you'll see the skylines. Okay, well, those are the two questions I have. Okay, cool. Yeah, holler if um, if any others come up. Okay, so we've talked about uh, you know remember the acronym uh, O B A F G K M, which had a kind of a sexist uh, mnemonic back in the old days, but um, uh, one of the female astronomers pointed out to me the way to remember that is only boys accepting feminism get kissed meaningfully. <laughs> I used to just switch it to uh, OB a fine OB. So there's OB a fine guy, kiss me, or you can do OB a fine gal, kiss me. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, it's not nearly as bad as the acronym for the determining the code on a on a resistor, but we can't put that on there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, you've we've moved into nerd space now. <laughs> um, okay, what can you see? Uh, with uh, the ALPI spectrograph. Uh, here's a, a series of spectra that I took uh, a while ago uh, of a uh, variable object called V1117 Her, which uh, is not exactly a star. It's a young stellar object. And you can see across the bottom that the streak of light, that's the, the image that you get from the, um, from the ALPI spectrograph. And, and you can see uh, toward the right-hand side of the streak the dot, uh, that's the hydrogen alpha emission line at uh, 65, 63 angstroms. 
And, and if you look at that series of spectra, which are taken only a few days apart from the, the, the top one to the next one below, that's three days, two more days, and then almost a week. And you can see how the strength of that hydrogen alpha emission line is changing basically on a nightly basis uh, as, as this uh, young stellar object is is still kind of going through its birth pangs and and bubbling and sparking uh, in H alpha. So the 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 stable and uh, stationary cosmos is really active when you start looking at some of the things things uh, with your spectrograph. The hydrogen beta absorption line, if you kind of squint and use your imagination, it seems to also be changing a little bit, not in sync with the emission at H alpha, but there's something going on there. Uh, so there's there's activity uh, and subtle changes. Whatever's happening, it's happening rapidly and strongly out there. Because you have a slit in your spectrograph now, you can take a spectrum of an extended object. This is uh, my guider image of uh, galaxy NGC 2655. And you can see the black line, that's, that's the, uh, the slit. So the light that falls through the slit uh, is what goes into the spectrograph. Uh, the guider is looking at light that is reflected off of the slit. So you see the galaxy and a few field stars around it. Um, on top is the spectrum of that galaxy. And it's it's a little noisy, but you can see that there's uh, some features uh, in it. Uh, and if you reach into the Palomar database uh, and look at their spectrum of this galaxy, which has been, been rectified to the uh, uh, rest wavelengths, uh, you can see that all of my spectral features are shifted a little bit to the right, uh, you know, look at um, uh, the um, observed wavelength uh, divided by the laboratory wavelength. And my spectrum says this guy has a uh, uh, 0.0049 redshift. Turns out you look it up in Simbad and the answer is 0.0047. Not bad for an 11 inch telescope in your backyard. Um, and just like we saw with um, the Orion Nebula, now that you have a slit in the spectrum, in the spectrograph, you can take spectra of extended objects like the, the uh, Ring Nebula. Same kind of a picture over on the left is the, uh, the Ring Nebula in the guider field and the vertical line is the uh, uh, slit of the spectrograph. So light that goes through the slit is spread out to make that spectrum uh, that uh, displays on the right. And you see two things. One, again, the nebula is only radiating on a certain set of spectral lines. That is a combination of the barcodes of the different emission lines that, that the nebula shines in. And in the vertical direction, you have some spatial resolution and can just barely see uh, the top and bottom bright edges of the ring as, as little faint streaks above and below the uh, center line. Uh, and you can just see the uh, uh, spectrum of the central star of the ring nebula. That's the, the streak that's dead center going across the spectrum. So you can not only isolate wavelengths, but you can actually see some spatial features in the perpendicular direction with a uh, long slit spectrograph. Um, now, here's, here's the ALPI. Let me talk a little about what the instrument is and does, and then what it means to your mount and your telescope and camera uh, if you want to do spectroscopy with an instrument like this. Uh, ALPI is a classical spectrograph. Uh, starting on the left, light comes in for your telescope, and the telescope focuses it uh, on the telescope's focal plane. That's where you put the slit, uh, uh, where your telescope is focused. The light that comes through the slit is collimated, sent through the grating, spread out into the rainbow, and then focused on a second focal plane. That's where your science camera goes. So now you've got a 
keep in mind two separate focal planes uh, that are going to affect how you operate things. Um, the, the slit, the collimator lens, and the grating are all contained within the Alpi core module shown uh, at the bottom here. The objective lens is contained in the rear housing. And as you can see from this picture, the whole thing is a very compact little optical system. Uh, literally, hold it in one hand with plenty of room left over. Um, the complete ALPI system, uh, light comes in from the telescope, again from the left. It'll first pass through the calibration module, then into the guiding module, then into the ALPI core, and finally onto the science camera where the spectrum is focused. The, uh, the, the slit grating uh, assembly is, is shown here inside the, um, the ALPI core module. So you saw the prices, it's about a grand for each piece, not including your science camera and your guide camera. Um, here's what the, the setup looks like on a, a C11. Uh, you can see the, the focuser, the calibration module, the guide module and the guide camera, uh, the Alpi core, and then the uh, science camera that collects the spectrum. A reasonable question is, do I need the guide module? Uh, what the guide module does is, remember, light comes in from the telescope and it passes through the slit uh, toward the, uh, the grating inside the spectrograph. The guide module makes the slit a reflective element. So um, aside from the little 23 micron wide line that passes energy into the spectrograph, everything else on that focal plane is, is reflected off uh, and directed into your guide camera and refocused there by these relay lenses. So that means you have a real life view of the focal plane where the slit is. If you don't have that, you have no way of getting starlight to pass through that 23 micron wide slit. Uh, in, in the typical setup, you know, that's a, a few arc seconds and none of us have a, a mount that can point the instrument at the target within a couple of arc seconds without doing a little adjusting. So uh, yeah, it costs $1,000. The, uh, the short answer is yeah, for, for astronomical spectroscopy, you've got to buy that, uh, that guide module. Um, the calibration module is a little more optional. Uh, remember, uh, take another look at typical spectrum. Uh, there is a streak of light uh, across the image, and your challenge is to translate it from intensity versus pixel position to intensity versus wavelength. Uh, and in a in a spectrum like this, you know there are no obvious spectral features that you can line up with a particular atomic line. Uh, and as I mentioned, you should probably be at, at this level of resolution, uh, a little reluctant to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and use uh, purely uh, bomber on some other star to uh, calibrate your uh, wavelengths on an image of this target star. What the calibration module does is injects a neon argon lamp uh, in front of the slit. And so you get an image like this on your camera uh, and you know the wavelengths of these uh, lines with great precision from laboratory measurements. And so you use these lines to establish that uh, calibration from pixel position to wavelength. Using a lamp is particularly important in uh, an instrument like the ALPI because the combination of a grating with a prism does not have a perfectly linear calibration curve. It's got a little bit of a wave to it. Uh, and and uh, a third or fourth order polynomial perfectly can match uh, what the actual wavelength calibration is. So the uh, Cal module uh, makes it uh, real easy to do that wavelength calibration, very convenient. You, you take your image of your target, um, then flip a switch 
on the calibration module and two things happen. A shutter falls to block the starlight, the neon argon lamp comes on, so now you store this image, and in your post-processing, you can wavelength calibrate that target image. Like any astro image, uh, you also have to do darks and flats. Flats are particularly tricky in a spectrum because the f you want to know not what the uh, dust bunnies and things are at the focal plane of the telescope, but rather after everything has gone through the spectrograph, uh, the Alpi-Cal module has a tungsten lamp in it also, so you can get flats uh, conveniently uh, through it. Uh, but there are other ways you can do it. You know, you can hold a tungsten lamp up in front of your telescope aperture. You can hold a neon argon lamp up in front of your telescope aperture uh, and have the same effect. But I think for most people, you quickly decide that the convenience of flipping a couple of switches uh, is uh, is worth $1,000 if you have the 1000 Um what about implications on your mount when you're uh, using a spectrograph like this? Uh, the whole spectrograph assembly only w with the, the ATIC camera uh, shown in red on here uh, is only about four pounds. So it's not going to stress your mount. But the package is long uh, from, the, uh, from the calibration module to the back of the camera here uh, is about seven inches. When uh, when this picture was taken, I had it on my fork-mounted C11. And when you stick a seven-inch long uh, instrument train off the back of the uh, focuser on the back of that C11, uh, you can't hardly point straight overhead before the instrument's bumping into the base of the fork. Um, I had to put a, uh, a two inch diagonal in the optical train to bend the optical path so that I could look uh, at an object in Cepheus at about DAC of 60 degrees and barely made it before the uh, uh, camera again was touching the, uh, the back of the mount. So if you have a fork mount, beware. Uh, it could be a real challenge to uh, use an instrument like this. The guider field of view depends a little bit on the telescope and the guide cam you're using, but it's going to be really small. Uh, think in terms of maybe a 10 arc minute field uh, for your guider. What that means is that uh, there's probably not enough stars in there to do a plate solve. So you're going to have to kind of, you know, look at the chart, look at the image and, and uh, 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 jump yourself to uh, put the uh, target star dead on to the slit. And you're going to need uh, good tracking uh, while, um, uh, while you're doing the exposure. Uh, the, the guide camera, of course, on the, on the guider module is the key to that. And because you're spreading the starlight out into a long slit, uh, you're spreading that uh, little bit of starlight out over a lot of pixels. Uh, and so you're going to need pretty long exposures for all but the brightest stars. Think anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour. Uh, use the same same method you do with, uh, I think, most astro imaging. If you need an hour of collected starlight, uh, you don't take a single hour long exposure. Take five minute exposures and, and stack them to get that full hour. Works the same way with uh, your spectrograph images. Um, the telescope. When uh, you're told that the uh, spectrograph is going to spread the starlight out into that long streak, hence uh, giving you a relatively low number of photons on each pixel, um, uh, your, your first thought uh, is often, well, I need a bigger telescope. Uh, it turns out that may or may not be the right answer. And uh, the reason for that is take a look at this optical diagram of what the complete system looks like. You know, light comes from the star. Uh, it, it goes through all the, uh, the uh, effects that the Earth's atmosphere does to it, uh, makes it into your telescope, and it gets focused on the slit. Only the starlight that passes through the slit gets into the spectrograph. So how big in microns is your star image at the focal plane of your telescope? Um, it's a function of the focal length of your scope. And for most of us, 
it's not driven by diffraction. It's driven by the seeing at, uh, at the sites that we observe in. Uh, you know, typical backyard site, probably in the neighborhood of two to four arc seconds for most of us. So the magic equation is that the physical size, the diameter of that star image, it's full width half max in microns, is, is your seeing in arc seconds times your focal length in millimeters divided by 206, the magic number. Um, for example, if your site has typical seeing of three arc seconds and you're using an eight inch F10 telescope, that translates into a star image about 30 microns in diameter, which is not a bad match to Alpi's 23 micron slit. You know, most of the starlight will get through and you'll still have the full resolution by virtue of that narrow slit. You might say, well, I'll put a focal reducer into the optical train. Uh, that same three arc second seeing, but now my eight inch telescope is an F6.3. Uh, I get a 19 micron star image, which is just about a perfect match to that slit. Almost all the starlight gets through. Um, that's good. Uh, in fact, I use a, a focal reducer on, uh, on my setup. Unfortunately, there's a limit to how far you can take that. Uh, the internal optics in Alpi will take a light cone as fast as F4, but the manufacturer recommends don't go faster than F5. Uh, I think faster than that, you start getting light scatter off of the, the edges and corners of some of the optics in there. But what that means is you probably don't want to go uh, to you know, run out and buy that 16 inch telescope just in order to collect more light. Because what you may find happening is the 16 inch aperture is collecting more light, but of course it also has a longer focal length. So I get a big blobby star image. So only a fraction of the light gets through the slit. Not clear whether, whether that's a winning combination. Uh, an awful lot of people uh, get really good spectra with uh, six inch uh, refractors, four inch refractors. The, the instrument's designed, as you see here, for uh, uh, a uh, backyard scale uh, Schmidt cast. So don't think you need to jump out and get a new telescope. Use the telescope you've got. Um, Here's an example of a project that I, I'm kind of in the middle of, um, but uh, uh, shows you uh, what you can see uh, in, uh, in the uh, spectrum. Just like variable star photometry, the, the thing that the small telescope scientist brings to the party is the ability to stay on that target night after night after night and make a complete map of the brightness change of the target. No professional observatory is ever gonna get the time allocation to committee to say, I need every night this month. You know, if you're a professional astronomer, you're lucky to get one night or two nights a year. Uh, so they rely on us to do this kind of thing. So this, uh, this star is a Myra variable. Uh, and I uh, just got curious uh, last June uh, what uh, kind of spectral changes I might see as it faded from uh, about magnitude 9 down to its about magnitude 13. By the way, that's an example. You can go pretty faint with uh, the uh, ALPI resolution. Um, Here's a uh, stack of the spectra that I took as the star faded. Uh, the spectrum at the very top is when it's magnitude 9.4, and it gets fainter and fainter and fainter as you go down. The bottom one is when it's at the bottom of its light curve uh, at magnitude 12.8. And you kind of see that bottom one is getting a little noisy. Uh, I probably should have used um, a two hour exposure instead of one hour there. Nevertheless, and I've zoomed in on the blue portion of the um, wavelength range from about 4,000 to about 5,000 angstroms where a lot of the spectral features that are useful for spectral classification uh, arise. Uh, you can see uh, starting on the right, uh, the strong titanium bands. You can see a mission line of magnesium 
uh, emission at H gamma and at iron uh, at two places, and then on the far left uh, uh, emission at hydrogen delta. Uh, and you know this is over a few months uh, as the star changes. Um, the uh, the uh, most diagnostic indication of the stellar temperature in uh, M-class stars is the titanium oxide band heads, the strength there. And you can barely tell, but if you look at the, the top one and you see how far down that titanium band head dips, and then look down at the bottom one, it's not that deep from top to bottom. Uh, the titanium strength gets larger as the star gets cooler. Well, here, as the star fades, it's getting smaller. So that means this, the temperature of the star is rising as it gets fainter, probably because the pulsation is moving in. Um, if you look at the hydrogen emission lines, remember we looked at uh, hydrogen in that young stellar object. Uh, here on the left, hydrogen delta, and in the middle, hydrogen gamma. If you look at the top spectrum, uh, the emission feature is very prominent. And if you follow down, you can see how it fades away and disappears by the time the star is at minimum brightness. Something going on regarding temperature and pressure in the layer that uh, those two lines are created. Hydrogen beta on the... Um, on the right-hand side, though, you follow that emission line down, it shrinks a little, but it does not disappear, uh, even at the bottom. So there's, there's some difference in uh, uh, temperature or pressure at the point where that line is being created in the star. Um, look at the metallic lines. Uh, the iron emission lines stay pretty constant as the, um, as the star fades. Uh, the magnesium emission line also stays pretty constant as the star fades. Uh, I think the story there is that they're created at a different radial position in the, in the stellar atmosphere. So pressures and temperatures are changing in different ways there. And if you look real close at that, that um, hydrogen line uh, in the middle here and follow it down, looking a little bit to the left, you can see that something's changing. There's, a, there's an absorption feature that's growing as the star fades. I haven't figured out what that is yet. That's still on my to-do list. So again, uh, things are changing relatively rapidly compared to the life of a star. And it turns out uh, spectral studies like this, consistent time series spectra over pulsating stars are very rare birds in the literature. Uh, the, because the, um, the research astronomers can't get the telescope time, but we can. And so they kind of rely on us to uh, follow the spectral changes and anchor their theories of astrophysics uh, from this kind of data. Uh, Bob, Yo. can you take a couple more questions? Absolutely. I was, John was wondering what elements you can readily detect in these kinds of spectrum and what would be kind of beyond, you know, too low a concentration or don't have emission or absorption lines? Yeah, um, that is a really complicated question. Uh, uh, and I am by no means an astrophysicist, but here's the story. Um, uh, stellar spectra, are, are kind of a bridge between astronomy and quantum mechanics. Uh, and it goes like this. Um, uh, let's, let's think back to those um, hydrogen bomber lines on um, a long ago picture um, here. No, that's not a good one. Here. Um, start at the top. Um, here's uh, hydrogen beta, where my cursor is on that B star. Um, the strength of hydrogen absorbing from, oh, Molly, you probably remember better than I. Is this from the, the uh, third level to the second level in the atom? Oh, I always mix these up. I think um, hydrogen alpha is the third to the second. Um, 
and beta, we'll see. Beta, beta is a blue wavelength, isn't it? So I yeah. guess that's going to be a higher transition because those are going to be closer together. Okay, so that's like third to the first. Uh, or no, and a higher like narrower transition, like four to three or three to. Well, uh, so I have to go look. I can't remember. <laughs> okay, I'm, okay, I'm in good company. I don't remember it either. But anyhow, you remember you learned about. Um, uh, Actually, no, you're right. Like wider transitions, more energy. So yeah, yeah. it's probably like three to one. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, you yeah. learned about about atomic energy levels and and when the electron falls from a high level to a low level, it emits light of that characteristic wavelength. Conversely, when it absorbs a photon of just the right wavelength, it, the, the photon can be absorbed by the atom. That means those kind of photons don't get through the chromosphere of the star. They get absorbed. And that's what the notch, the absorption feature, is all about. And you can see here that the strength of that absorption, the ability of the hydrogen atom to, uh, to absorb uh, photons of that wavelength, depends on the temperature in the environment where the atom is. When it's really, really hot in these, in these hot blue stars, you don't see much of an absorption feature because um, the, the, all of those atoms are already thermally excited. So there's nobody left in the ground state to absorb a photon as it goes by. So it doesn't get absorbed. In the temperature range here uh, in the in the A2 star, that turns out to be prime territory. There's a lot of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, atoms in that lower energy level just waiting to absorb a photon. So when a photon comes by, it gets absorbed. Hence, you see the dip uh, in the um, uh, in the spectrum. As the so, Bob, I mm -hmm. guess the question was more about what elements you could or could not detect. Obviously, yeah. hydrogen is, you know, well, most it, most of what we see. And and yeah. and Bob, Bob, before you go down that road, I also read that question as just how much resolution do you have in this? Yeah, that the resolution is a good question. The Alpi's resolution, delta lambda over lambda, is about is between five hundred and six hundred. Now, what that means is. Um, depending on the temperature of the object you're looking at, different elemental lines are available to be in the spectrum and they have to be strong enough that you can see them with that level of resolution, um, which is relatively low resolution. You're not going to do radial velocity studies on, on binary stars, for example. Is that a shorter answer to the well, I think I, I'm not sure, but it's. It, I think the question was it wants a kind of a list of elements that you might be able to see. Like I saw you had magnesium on, on one of the latter spectrum. Yeah, if you uh, on this picture, if you look at the um, uh, the the yellow line, that's the uh, uh, the G star, and the K line, uh, the, or the orange line, that's the K star. You see all those bumps and wiggles. Uh, all of those are elemental lines. Uh, some of them are are two lines, probably from two different elements, so close together uh, that you can't really tell them apart. If you can see my cursor, you know, like you look at this guy on the orange line, it's pretty clear there's two lines there, but they're so close to overlapping, you can't tell them apart. So that's the limited resolution of Alpi. But every one of those features is coming from some atom or molecule in the atmosphere of the star. Well, on Beatrice had a are there any books or videos that you would recommend if someone wanted yeah. to get started with this or improve their technique? Yes. Um there's uh uh let me let me go back to my bookshelf here. Francois Cochard wrote, is that coming through on my screen or on my camera? Yeah, I've uh, got a video of you. I'll make it a little bigger. Okay. Uh, it's called Successfully Starting an Astronomical Spectroscopy by Francois Cochard. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this is, is really the go-to book if you're uh, uh, saying, I want to uh, play with a slit spectrograph for the first time. Uh, and understand how to use it and what I'm seeing. 
Um, there are also a couple of books. I think Ken Harrison uh, wrote one. And I don't remember the name, but they're uh, a good uh, introductory book to understand what you're seeing in the spectrum. I'll, um, I guess, Alex, I can, I can uh, send you uh, uh, the title uh, of that if I find it. Molly, could we put that up in the chat? Uh, yeah. yeah I I actually, actually, Bob, Bob, one of our um, one of our contributors, I think, has already um, listed Harrison's uh, book. Perfect. And Barbara, Barbara Harris and Beatrice Hines are both uh, chipping in. Um, Astronomical spectroscopy for amateurs by Ken Harrison. That's it. And uh, Barbara Harris has suggested spectroscopy for amateurs and astronomers by Mike by Mark. Tripstein and Richard Walker. Oh yeah, yeah. Richard Walker's book is great. So yes, there are there is good reference material out there. And John has clarified his question about uh, what I called resolution. How low a concentration or signal do you need in order to get re something registered? Um, I'm not sure that at the resolution of ALPI, you can meaningfully do um, composition measurements uh, on the stars. I, I have no experience with that, but I think um, it requires a little more fidelity than, than we've got in these spectra. It's also a mind boggling complicated thing uh, because as you know, again, go back to the simple example of hydrogen. Uh, you can't just look at the line and say whether there's hydrogen in the star or not. Um, the uh, Because it depends on the temperature of the star, whether there's the signal from hydrogen. One of the odd, interesting anecdotes about um, stellar physics is, is in the early 1900s, uh, nobody figured that the sun was made of hydrogen there wasn't any significant hydrogen lines in the spectrum. So anyhow, compositional studies are really complicated. <laughs> I, I remember when I was trying to prepare a report on something that I didn't know anything about, which happens often with me. Um, and I um, was trying to figure, and I there's a table someplace that says what each element glows in. And while we all know that um, H A glows here, and this, that, the other thing. Actually, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of designations all the way through. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of lines out there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So. There's you know every every element has a bazillion lines, uh, and and so partly it's you need to to know what the line means, but you also have to address the problem of uh, is are the physical conditions such that that line will appear in the spectrum? And often the physical, the conditions, the temperatures and pressures are such that uh, a lot of it, you know, like there's there's uh, uh, you know, plenty of iron in the sun, but there's no really strong iron lines in the solar spectrum because the conditions are such that, you know, those transitions aren't tickled. I think we've derailed your train of thought here. <laughs> No, this, yeah. is, this is great because I was. If I was want to get back to the presentation, I was actually on my last slide. So this yeah, is I thought perfect. so. <laughs> so they get there. Um, so um, spectroscopy is kind of the new frontier for small telescopers and researchers. It does give you uh, a completely different view of the stars. Uh, it is undeniably sciency. Uh, you know, you're 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 not looking and going, ooh, ah, you're, you're looking and making measurements. Uh, but uh, if, if uh, you gain a, a sufficient skill, there are real scientists out there uh, who are looking for spectra from amateur observers because we can get spectra that they can't. And like in uh, photometry, uh, the go-to uh, thing is time series. You're not going to make a discovery by just taking a spectrum of a star and saying, look at that. But uh, you stick with, uh, with that star for uh, uh, you know, a week or a month or a year and see how it changes. Uh, that's, uh, 
uh, where surprises come in. Uh, and uh, and it's used to augment other observations. You know, there may be uh, people using uh, ultraviolet spectrographs uh, on a space platform uh, and radio telescopes, uh, but they need optical spectra to fill in that hole in their uh, uh, in their spectral energy distribution, and we can do that for them. Okay. Finally, if if you're interested in this kind of sciencey stuff, don't forget the Society for Astronomical Sciences is out there looking for you. Um, our annual symposium in uh, the middle of 2021, dates are still TBD, but we know uh, that we're gonna have to do it online. Uh, and uh, so join us and see what uh, other people are doing uh, with their backyard telescopes to, to uh, contribute to science. There's the website. More questions? Bob, can I ask a question? Hmm? Uh, you said earlier that uh, extended objects reduce resolution. Is it possible to detect the composition of different galaxies? Like if I'm looking at, say, Barnard's galaxy, which is very sparse, contrasting a very rich, say, grand spiral galaxy, it's seeing what's inside the galaxy as a whole. And do, are they different from galaxy to galaxy? Um. I'm not sure. Uh, I've I've done spectra of a few galaxies, mostly uh, for G Wiz. I can see it, um, and um, the, the spectra are complicated and confusing because instead of one star in your slit, you got probably a billion of them. Um, I'm not sure what uh, what we can uh, can do on uh, galaxies with uh, this kind of instrument. Okay, yeah, probably. Gonna... Probably crying out for somebody to do it and find <laughs> out. Uh, I've got one more question. You you mentioned that you were doing very long exposures sometimes. How much of an effect does wonky guiding have on the intensity values that you're recording? Um, yeah. If it travels off the slit or something. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Obviously, that that does happen, and um, uh, I use the same thing that that you asked our amateurs do is uh, take subs and if you get a bad sub just throw it away uh you know and, and so instead of a one hour exposure you've only got a 50 minute exposure um the intensity calibration is um a sort of again pull yourself up by the seat of your pants uh, just like in the uh, slitless spectrograph, the, the intensity versus wavelength in your spectrum of an object uh, is, is a, a combination of what the object actually sent out times what the atmosphere let through times what got through the slit and through the, the transmission of your optics. And the way you back that out is by uh, making a, another spectrum of a star whose <laughs> exoatmospheric uh, spectrum is well known and well calibrated. And so you just like when you do flat fielding, you divide out the effect of your instrument and the atmosphere. Um, in, in terms at least of consistency, that seems to work to the few percent level uh, over most of the spectral range. The atmospheric effects uh, toward the blue end are sufficiently strong that, you know, you do the same thing twice and you may get curve that's 5%, maybe 10% different. Uh, so that's sort of the consistency that you see there. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, how are we doing, on it, Eric? We've got all the questions in. I think we got them all. Okay. Um, Bob, if you could, if you could uh, give up your presenting. Oh, certainly. Um, no, he, he, did, he did. did. I did. Yeah, you're good. Oh, yours. Okay. Um, uh, just to conclude, I want to thank Bob for being here tonight and turning us all on to um, getting, you know, contributing to science with our cameras that we already have. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. It's a, it's a pretty interesting thing. I've got a few people that have been playing with the SAS for a while that surround me out at the um, out of Goat Mountain. And so I know that there's a, they, they really get excited about their stuff they're doing. Bob has a lot of other stuff too about contributing to science. He's written a few books on it and stuff like that. But 
you know, just check them out, check out the books. I think you'll enjoy them. I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, if everything is working as it should be working, you should be seeing Orion time slides. This is not the actual production we're going to make. This is uh, just me grabbing the slides and putting him here. And then uh, you got to February 7th to get all your slides in, any pictures that you want to do. I would really rather have you submit them here to the website rather than Facebook. They're easier to transfer in and take care of. Um, and then we'll dress them up. And uh, shortly after February 7th, we'll have the little show. So contribute them uh, as you go along. Uh, to come back next week, Kevin Francis is going to tell us a little bit about um, mistakes he's made, growth he's made, some wonderful things he's done with Astro Imaging, why it excites him. Uh, it's a pretty good story. So I hope you're all back next week. Um, thank you very much, Bob, for being here. And if anybody wants to volunteer for anything, please try to go through the website. I don't think any of us actually follow the comments too closely on the YouTube channel. There's just way too many of them coming in. If you really want to communicate with us, go through the contact information on the website. And I think that's where we may have missed Hank earlier. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Uh, see you next week with Kevin Francis talking about his astro imaging journey. Bye. Bob, if, yes, you wanna, Polly. Yeah. if you want to hang out with us a little bit, just stay on. Okay. <laughs>